This is part two of our series on PhotoKey 4's filters toolset. In this video, we will look at some more artistic filters found exclusively in PhotoKey 4 Pro. The first filter we will examine is Hue Shift, which we are going to apply to the background image. Hue Shift takes all of the colors in a selected layer and rotates them around the color wheel to the degree specified by the hue slider. So first, let's turn the strength all the way up, and then as I adjust this hue slider, you can see how the colors in the background gradually get shifted so that the various hues are modified based on where I have the slider positioned in this spectrum. This filter can be very useful for modifying backgrounds to better complement the colors in your foreground image. The next filter is Sharpen. Sharpening works by finding edges in your image and increasing contrast in those areas to add more definition to the details. Sharpening should be used judiciously as it is easy to overdo but a little sharpening can really increase an image's impact. For those unfamiliar with the sharpening process, it's a good idea to start by viewing your image at 100%, which you can do by right-clicking anywhere in the zoom slider. Now, there are two basic approaches to take to sharpening. The first is to use a fairly high radius and a low sharpness setting. This method is the default and is often more desirable for portrait work because it tends not to enhance minor imperfections or flaws in the skin. The second technique is to use a very small radius and a fairly high sharpness to bring out the finer details in an image. This often gives a grittier appearance. But remember that it is very easy to lose the natural look of a photograph by applying too much sharpening. If we just max the sharpness out like this, then you can really see especially if we compare it to the unsharpened image, how much the sharpened filter is modifying the image. And there you can really start to see the light and dark halos around the edges in the image, and we can tell that we have probably gone too far. Let's go ahead and turn this back down a bit to a more reasonable setting. The first of two new filters introduced in version 4 of PhotoKey Pro is the Defocus filter. This is essentially a blur filter, but it more accurately simulates the blur created by photographic lenses by using a customized blurring algorithm as well as giving you control over the bloom in the highlight areas. The blur slider controls the size of the blur or how soft the image becomes. And the bloom slider controls how much brightness is applied to the highlights. There's just a standard blur of the image. But then as you increase the bloom, you can see how the image washes out to more accurately replicate the bouquet of a photographic lens. In general, the larger the blur setting, then the higher the bloom should be set as well. Diffuse is the second new filter added in version 4 of PhotoKey Pro. Diffusion softens the appearance of the selected layer by creating a copy of it, applying a blur to the copy, then laying that blur back over the original image at a reduced transparency. So again, the blur controls the size of the blur applied to that copy of the image. And then the strength slider controls the opacity of the blurred layer over the original layer. At higher levels, the original is almost completely obscured by the diffuse layer. For this image, let's set the strength to about 34 and the blur to around 30. Our next filter, Silhouette, is only found in the foreground tab, since you won't ever need a silhouette of your background image. Once the silhouette filter is activated, it instantly creates a silhouette from your layer, and then you can change the color by clicking the Change button and selecting any color you like using the color picker. For this image, I want to make the silhouette of the guitarist look sort of like it's painted onto that metal surface in the background, so I'm going to select kind of a grayish blue that works with the colors in the background. Then, to finish this image off, I'm going to go back up and apply transparency and set that to about 40% to let the texture of the background image show through. Shadow cast can greatly enhance your composites by allowing you to create drop shadows or realistically cast shadows from your foreground onto your background. I'm going to go in and turn off our background layer and then add a white canvas color in the background so we can clearly see the shadow effects. The shape menu gives you several starting points which you can select from based on the lighting in your images. The first two, shadow right and shadow left, cast a shadow to either side of the foreground as if light were coming in from a side angle. Drop shadow simulates front light 
and casts a shadow immediately behind your foreground, as if there were a wall right behind them. Shadow forward gives the appearance of backlight, so that a shadow is cast down in front of the subject. For this image, we're going to use the drop shadow effect. We'll go back and turn our background on once again. A green bounding box surrounds your shadow and gives you control over its size and shape. Click anywhere inside the box and drag to reposition the shadow. Right click and drag to resize the shadow from the location of the cursor. Any of the control points can be dragged to distort the shadow's shape. Right click and drag on the center control point of any side of the shadow to create a perspective distortion. I'm going to switch back to a default and then I want to create a shadow that's basically right behind our subject and just a little bit larger so then I'll increase the size of that a bit. Blur controls the softness of the shadow's edges. So there the shadow is very soft or at zero you have a hard sharp edge to the shadow shape. Transparency adjusts the intensity of the shadow. Usually somewhere around the mid-range is the most effective. You can select a color for the shadow using the change button, but in most cases the default black is fairly effective. If the natural shadows in your background have a bit of tint to them though, then changing the shadow color to match can make for a more realistic composite. The blend mode should be left at multiply for most standard shadow applications, though different blend modes can be useful for creating different effects. Here I used a light blue shadow color and an add blend mode to create a sort of glow around the subject. As another alternative, we could remove the blur for a bolder graphic style. Let's jump back to the first image we are working with and apply a more natural shadow to finish off this composition. You can see that she appears to just be floating there in front of the background. So we will add a shadow to ground her a bit. Let's select a drop shadow and then we're going to smash it down a bit. Just squish that to get a smaller shape and position that so that it's beneath her. Now let's soften it by increasing the blur quite a bit. We'll go to 130 somewhere in there. And we'll make it a little bit darker to fit the heavy contrast in our image by adjusting the transparency down to 33. And you can see that now there's a much more natural feel of her sitting on the ground there as opposed to the sort of floating look that we had before adding the shadow. The final filter is available only in the background tab and is used to simulate depth of field in your composite. I've imported a different background image so I can demonstrate this filter more clearly. Rather than just blurring the image like the blur or defocus filters do, depth of field allows you to control the areas affected by the blur to create a graduated blurring in the background as if it recedes from the camera. Click the focus button and you get a crosshairs on the canvas that allows you to set the point of focus. By default, this is centered on the bottom of the image. The focal plane runs horizontally by default, but you can change the angle of this, if you wish, using the angle wheel. I'm going to right-click that control to reset it to its default. The amount of blur can be controlled with the blur slider. We'll turn that up to make the effect more dramatic. Spread adjusts the width of the in-focus area, making more of this area at the bottom of our canvas, which is where we had our focus placed, in focus. Range modifies the width of the transition area from in focus to out of focus. So if we bring that all the way down, you can see that there now we have a hard line between the in focus area and the blurred area. But as we increase the range, that gradually gets softer and softer so that you can make a more subtle transition from one to the other. I'm going to bring that down a bit more, set it around 40. And then transparency allows you to alter the total strength of the effect on your background image. So if you wanted to just soften the effects of that blur, you could turn that up more. But in this case, I'm going to leave it all the way down so that we have the full effect of the depth of field being applied. In the type menu, you can change the effect from horizontal to radial, which allows you to create a sort of blur vignette to blur out the edges or corners of your background without affecting the center. When set to radial, the spread slider controls the diameter of the in-focus area, 
while the range still controls the width of the feather around the edge of the focused area. I'm going to reset this to the horizontal. And you might remember we mentioned that by default, the center of the focal area was placed at the bottom of the canvas in the center. This is so you could have your subject standing on the ground there in the front of the image and have that ground in focus along with the subject and then have the background gradually lose focus as it recedes into the distance, as it does here. It's a fairly natural looking subtle effect that we have going on here, but if we turn the depth of field off again for a moment, there's some nice detail in those clouds in the original, but then by simulating the depth of field, we can add a nice gradual blur to that background. We have now covered each of the filters individually and looked briefly at how they can be of practical use. Our next video will focus on how the filters can be used to create usable background images from any image you want.